Good morning. It's a joy to be in the house of the Lord, is it not? And I'm looking for Pastor Roland Kuhn. Where are you, Pastor Roland Kuhn? It's an honor to be with you and your lovely wife, Angela. It's been about 25 years since I've been here. And um, so I get around about, about four times a century. It's about time I come by. Four times a century. Um, I've been privileged to, to minister for 40 years. I'm 59 years young. And I accepted the call of God in the ministry when I was 14. I began preaching when I was 18. And the Lord has been gracious to me. Last year, a group of leaders gave me an award because I was crossing 10 million actual air miles. Now, to give you a little perspective, round trip to the moon and back is 500,000 miles. Just give you a little perspective. So I say to my lovely daughters every once in a while at night when looking at the moon, Dad goes past the moon every year. It's true, I do. But the reason I highlighted Pastor Roland and Angela just for a moment, and, and I'm going to highlight Pastor Ryan in just a moment. You know, um, when missionary Judson left the no North America to go preach the gospel, he was the very first missionary to leave North America 200 years ago to take the gospel to India and ended up in Myanmar. He buried two wives overseas. He never made it back here to this uh, eastern seaboard alive. He, he died in, on the boat on the way back. And if you ever get a chance to go up to the Pilgrim Cemetery at Plymouth, Massachusetts, take advantage of it. Most people go to check out the rock and check out the boat, and that's fine. But go up to the Pilgrim Cemetery where the founders are buried. And you will see missionary Judson's grave there. And his son spoke at the funeral more than 125 years ago. And in summary to his dad's life, he made these statements. He said, if you're succeeding without much sacrifice, it's because somebody has sacrificed for your success. But if you are sacrificing without much success, it's because you're sacrificing for someone's future success. Pastor Roland and Angela faithfully, faithfully served this church for 40 years. Um, <laughs> less than one-tenth of all pastors in the world stay 40 years in a church. There are over 10 million churches in the world. Less than one-tenth of one percent of all pastors in the world stay more than 40 years. Most pastors stay three or four or five years and move on to another place. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that when Roland and Angela came, they came to sacrifice for our future success. They came to give their very best. And you have taught us a lot, Roland and Angela. Thank you for teaching us how to lead. Thank you for teaching us how to learn, learn from God's Word. Teach us how to love the diversity in the body of Christ to teach us how to leave a legacy that lasts. That's who Roland and Angela are. And many of you are just getting acquainted with the Global Church Network. There are 2,600 different denominations and in over 665,000 churches in the Global Church Network. And every year, starting today, the second Sunday of March, every year, we throughout the network will declare it as Roland and Angela Kuhn Day throughout the world. Can somebody say hallelujah? Because you have taught us how to faithfully stay on the assignment until it's done. So many people get started and they quit when a virus comes by or something else happens. They just hang it on a nail and say, well, that was good while it lasted. But God has given you choice leadership. And now God has given you a phenomenal pastor, Pastor Ryan, who's going to take the church further than it's ever gone before. That's right. Amen. God's given you a wonderful pastor and pastor's wife and a couple children. And, and I'm here to tell you that God has huge plans made available for this church. But we have to reach out and take them. 
we have to claim them and believe that they are ours for the glory of the Lord. And it is an honor and a privilege uh, to be here uh, today. I always enjoy coming to this area of the, of the nation. I live in Florida. I wasn't born in Florida. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. And you say, I can't believe that with that accent. Well, I was South Brooklyn, but I was born in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> and, and my parents moved south, and I went to a Bible college and seminary in Missouri and finished my doctoral work in Chicago. Twelve years ago, I moved to Florida, not because of the sand or the sea, but because of travel. And Orlando's become a phenomenal international airport for us to travel in and out of, to get the work done, to save time, to save money, but maximize our effectiveness. And so I flew up last uh, afternoon, had a great flight. Uh, I didn't see people passing out on the airplane. I, it was just an incredible flight along the coast. Uh, and so I want you to know, uh, don't, let, uh, don't let fear grab your life. Okay, don't let it happen to you. You know, I, uh, I said it in the early bird service, and I'll say it here in the second service. I said, you know, we can get concerned about the virus, about what we've taken in, right? And um, we ought to be concerned about what we eat. We ought to be concerned about what we drink. We ought to be concerned about what we put in our mind. So during this time, why don't you just assess all the areas of your life so that we can fulfill our divine destiny. Amen? Amen. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, we're very focused in Nepal uh, right now. And uh, to the right is China. To the left is India. There's a billion in China. There's a billion in India. There's um, 30 million in Nepal. So if you're going to build a strong beachhead, you would want to connect China and India. And the only way you're going to do that is to do something great in Nepal. And there are 108 million Christians in China. There are 60 million Christians in India. There's 1.4 million Christians in Nepal. 45,000 a day are coming to Christ in China. Over 20,000 a day are coming to Christ in India. So if you're going to do a work, you would want to do a work where God's doing a work. And so, Nepal is a phenomenal bridge opportunity. Go to the next slide. It's a picture of a hub. We launched this hub there about 18 months ago. A hub does three things. It synergizes best relationships, brings the best people together. It systematizes the very best training. And so, we can strategize for those who have yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, this hub has now become seven hubs in all the major provinces of Nepal. There are 95 hubs now in the Global Church Network. Six years ago, there were no hubs. By 2022, there will be 200 hubs. By 2030, if the Lord tarries, there will be 800 hubs. And all of them in sync to bring the best people together, systematize the best training, strategize for those who yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go to the next slide, if you would. And cross the, the Himalayas. There's 1,500 miles wide. They start below the southern part of China, make their way across Nepal, bump across Tibet, cross India all the way to Pakistan. And there are 20,000 villages across the Himalayas that do not have a church in them. They've never had a church in them. We're getting ready for the second coming of Christ, but they don't know Christ came the first time. They've never heard. They don't know about Easter. They don't know about Christmas. They've never heard the greatest name of all. How many of us believe that every village ought to have a church? I have heard my whole life as a Christian about the underground church where it's illegal to meet, and I've been in some of those places. But in the days ahead, I want to hear about the upper ground church, the highest elevations of the world. And the reason why they don't have the gospel, because it's hard. We're talking about areas where there are no roads, the only way you can get there is climb there and camp there, move there, and live there. We're talking about the hardest elevations in the world. Go to the next slide, if you would. This is one picture of the Himalayas. You know, I thank the Lord for the beautiful rolling hills of Delaware, but these are about 10 feet taller. Not much, just 10 feet taller there. Um, go to the next slide, if you would. This is one of the villages in the summertime. 
Um, the average wage in that area of the world, the Himalayas, is about $50 a month, $600 a year. And yet, there may not be a road there, but we've got to plant a church there. Go to the next slide, if you would. And this is a picture of Mount Everest, 29,000 uh, feet. I took it out of an airplane early one morning, flying out. It's a beautiful day. And they flew me over the Himalayas. I wanted to pray over the Himalayas. I wanted to pray a big prayer. I wanted to pray God put a church in every village across the Himalayas. I'm so happy to announce to you that before this year is out, the network is going to help launch the very first Bible school in the heart of the Himalaya Mountains, in the heart of the Himalaya Mountains. And it's in the base of Mount Everest, and we're going to call it Everest Bible School. Don't you know? You can't improve upon the word Everest. You don't need to come up with another word. It can't get much bigger than Everest. And because it's too expensive for people to leave the heart of the mountains to get to Kathmandu when you're only making $50 a month. And so we've got to go to where uh, the people are. Go to the next slide, if you would. And we hosted a summit there not too long ago called Give Me This Mountain Summit after the words of Caleb saying on his 85th birthday, he wanted to claim that mountain for God. And so we, we hosted that summit, and, and God helped us to launch it. Go to the next slide, if you would. And this gentleman in the green is a pastor. And I want you to see where he pastors. Go to the next slide. He pastors up in Dolpo. Go look all the way to the left. And that little yellow dot is Dolpo up next to Tibet. Now, Dolpo is at the 15,000-foot level. For him to get to the Give Me This Mountain Summit, he had to hike 15 days one way through the Himalayas to get to a bus stop, to catch the bus, to get to Kathmandu. And when Kathmandu was over, took the bus to the last stop, hike 15 days back through the Himalayas to get to Dolpo. Now, when I said hike, I didn't say stay in a Holiday Inn all along the way. Uh, he stayed outside every night, 15 nights, in the Himalayas. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to send a missionary to Dolpo. God already has one there. We don't need to compete with him. We need to complete with him. Amen. See, God has his people everywhere. See, in the past, we just went. Now we have to ask who's already there as we go. Because if we're ever going to finish the assignment, we have to get to the place that we don't care who gets the credit. It's not about ego and logo. It's about finishing the Great Commission. And somebody said amen. It really is. Go to the next slide if you would. And so we hosted the summit, and over 1,500 leaders uh, gathered, and, um, and the Lord helped us to, to get the initiative off the ground. Now we have church planters partnering with us at the 21 and 22,000-foot level. They see snow 365 days a year, uh, and they're planting churches in the villages across the Himalayas. And the goal is by 2030, the 2,000-year birthday of the church, that all 20,000 villages will have churches in them from the southern part of China all the way to Pakistan so that everyone will have an adequate witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Go to the next slide if you would. And, and so following my teaching today, um, uh, Dorothy's going to share and give the opportunity for you to, to, to give in the offering. And every $20 is going to help us to equip uh, a pastor and leader there. And let me tell you how powerful the dollar is, and then I'll teach. It is that when I was there uh, hosting on the second time, first time rather, and we were having a large summit, we were going to have about 40, 45 leaders to meet us in a side room at the hotel and a meeting in the meeting. And so um, the, the one key pastor said, James, it'll cost about hundred dollars for that meeting for three hours and I said that's fine he said oh James that, that's not fine I said well that's fine it's three hundred dollars for three hours of the 40 liters and then it hit me that the average wage in Kathmandu is hundred eighteen dollars a month and so I was asking him to spend a month's wage for a three-hour meeting and I had to back up and I realized whoa wait a minute and so we had the meeting outside and some chairs outside that night. You see, the money goes a long way there. Nepal is one of the poorest nations in all the world, but it's filled with some of the greatest people in all the world. And these men and women want to plant churches where that God's been calling them to do, 
They're raising half the support. We're raising the other half so that we can plant churches across the Himalayas. And for the very first time, all the Himalayas, 57 million people, will have the access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when Dorothy comes, I want to encourage you so generously. And I believe that we'll have the opportunity of doing something great for the Lord. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word today? I want to read one verse, Psalm 118, verse 24. Psalm 18, verse 24. And I think every one of us know this verse by heart. And the reason I like us to stand for the reading of God's word is in honor of his word. And aren't you thankful we have God's word in English? We have his word in English. Do you know how we got it in English? William Tyndale was burned at the stake because he translated it into English. He gave his life. And sometimes we just forget. It wasn't done by computer. Somebody translated it in our tongue so that we could hear and understand and read the gospel. And this, the psalmist said in 118, verse 24, these words, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us grumble and complain all day long. Is that what it said? Now, I believe that all of us can say it together because we all know it. So th let's all say it together. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And everything I want to teach today is going to come from this very familiar verse. May God add his blessings upon his word. You may be seated. We've been in a series on worship. And this is the fifth message on worship in this series. And I want to teach this morning on worshiping God while it is day. Worshiping God, worshiping while it is day. And I hope that God will deposit godly wisdom in each and every one of our hearts. We are to take a God-given day and turn it into a God-governed day so that it might become a God-gladdened day. What is the goal? To take a God-given day and turn it into a God-governed day so that at the end of the day, it might be a God-gladdened day. The psalmist said, this is the day the Lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it. If we're going to make every day a worship day, we need to first of all understand it is a provided day. God has given us this day. God doesn't have to take life from me. All he has to do is stop giving me a new day. And I'm going to just say those words that are on the slides. Go ahead and jump up the next slide, and I'll say those words right along the way. Thank you very much. We have been given a provided day. God doesn't have to take life from you. All he has to do is stop giving you another day. Every one of us in this room had the same amount of time in every day. We have some 86,000 seconds, some 1,400 plus minutes. And the reason why I highlight the seconds is because I know when you got up this morning and you're having breakfast, you were saying, I wonder how many seconds I have today. But no matter who we are, we can't purchase another minute. They say Mr. Bezos is the wealthiest, wealthiest person in the world, uh, but that's really not true. That's recorded wealth. Really, the richest person in the world is the king of Saudi Arabia. His kingdom is worth $1.3 trillion. And by the way, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But even if you're the king of the Saudi Arabia or the founder of Amazon or the founder of Microsoft, you can't purchase another minute. You can't acquire another second. That's how valuable it is. Some time ago, a man purchased a $7 million watch. I don't know what goes in a $7 million watch. Uh, I don't wear a watch. I'm not anti-watch. I travel light, and so I don't carry a watch. I just check it out on my phone. I don't know what goes in a $7 million watch, but I know this. After he purchased a $7 million watch, he didn't have any extra time the next day than he did the day before. It's not what you wear on your wrist. It's what God does in your heart. You can have a more expensive watch than I do, but you don't have any extra time than I do. It may only be a minute, but eternity is in it. 
Watch how a man or a woman manages his time or her time, and you will understand the level of their worship before the Lord. Have you ever said to yourself, I wish I had more time? None of us get the extra time. God gives us the gift of time to do what he's called us to do. If you're running out of time to do the things that God has called you to do, maybe you're doing some things in your life you don't need to be doing. We have a provided day. But secondly, it is a present day. He said, this is the day. He didn't say this was the day. He didn't say this will be the day. He said, this is the day. We have to learn to worship in the present tense of the day. There are two days that will rob us of the day, and that is yesterday and tomorrow. Some people wish for yesterday, others worry about tomorrow, and they fail to worship in today. You don't just live in yesterday. You may learn from yesterday, but you don't live in yesterday. And we don't just get so wrapped up about tomorrow. We need to enjoy the day that God has given to us. Uh, the great apostle Paul said, he said, I let go. I let go of some things, and I press toward the high calling of Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago Friday, I was in Rome, Italy. <gasps> I was in Italy. <laughs> and I took a pastor friend with me to the maritime prison. If you ever get a chance to go, go. It's where the Apostle Paul would write First and Second Timothy. He would write Ephesians, and he would write Philippians there in the maritime prison. When you go, don't stay 30 seconds. Stay 20, 25 minutes until you let it soak in to you. And he was there, and he would say, I let go of some things as I press toward the high calling of Jesus Christ. we got to let go of some things. They let go of past guilt. Don't let the ghost of guilt rob you of your worship today. Don't let the devil beat you up with the past of yesterday. Once God has forgiven you, you are forgiven. It is though you've never sinned before in your life. And get up and love God with all of your heart because he has forgiven you of your sin and you're in right relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, let go of past guilt. Let go of past glory. I thank God for the successes of yesterday. I thank God for the awakenings of yesterday. I thank God for the revivals of yesterday. But we don't just live in yesterday. You ever been around somebody, been five years since you got around them, and they're still talking about the same things they were talking about five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? That's a person who hit the pause button and chose to let life pass him or her by. I thank God for all of yesterday. But ladies and gentlemen, we need revival today. We need an awakening today. We need the miraculous today. We need God to rend the heavens today and for the glory of God to come down. One thing that makes me nauseated more than anything else is when somebody takes credit for what God has done. When people say, look what I did or look what we did. My friend, if there's victory, it's because the Lord has given us the victory. It's not because we're smart enough or skilled enough, because God chose to bless our life. I used to say, let's go out and change the world, but I don't say that anymore. The Lord didn't call us to to change the world. He called us to save the world. If there's a man that's dying or a woman that's dying in a river, drowning in a river or a lake or an ocean, they don't say, come over here and change me. They say, come over here and save me. And after the saving comes the change, not before. I don't bring the change. Jesus Christ does the saving, and the change comes out of it. I may bring the gospel, but it's the Lord Jesus Christ that does the work, not James, not you. My friend, all the glory and honor goes to the king of the universe. Oh, we got to let go of past glory. We got to let go of past grudges and past grief. Uh, in the 1990s, my wife and I, we lay, laid to rest two children. Uh, one in 1991 and one in 1998. Our first, daughter, our first child was named Jennifer. Our second son was named James. And as you can imagine, that was a difficult time for my wife and I to walk through that period of time in our life. But if you're not careful, that grief can become a grave. 
And if you're not careful, you'll get stuck there. And if you're not careful, you'll get bitter there. And you'll let life pass you by. And the, the, after the millennium t came in the new millennium, my wife and I, we adopted two amazing daughters from mainland China. Uh, our oldest daughter is Olivia, and she was born 010101. She's got to be the one. I mean, she was, she, that's her birthday. That's her birthday. And, and that's pretty cool. I said, maybe you're going to be involved in computer, 010101. Our second daughter is, was born March 19, 2006. Her name is Priscilla. Both of our girls are from China. Not too long ago, I was sitting with my girls, and I said, Mom and Dad had to drive their car through the graveyard to get to China. And if we hadn't weren't careful, we were going to miss it all. And I'm here to tell you there comes a time we grieve and we mourn, but there comes a time that we have to move on. we got to let go of past grudges. If you bring grudges into today, you won't worship God today. Has anybody ever wronged you, ever backstabbed you, undermined you, ridiculed you, gossip behind your back? Is your goal to get even? Well, there's a Chinese proverb for that. If you're going to set out to get even, dig two graves, one for you and one for the other person. Now, think about it with me for a second. You get an email that makes your hair stand up. And you say, I can't believe I got that email. I'm going to set the record straight. Well, let me ask you a question. How long is it going to take you to set the record straight? Do you think it's just one email? Don't think so. That person's already loaded up the gun. You send one back, here comes another one. You send another one, it comes another one back. And before long, you spend 15 hours trying to set the record straight. Instead of serving God and worshiping God, you're chasing rabbits. I'm here to tell you, stay on the high ground and let God balance the books of your life. Let God balance the books of your life. <laughs> you got to let go of yesterday. And then you, you get just so wrapped up and worried about tomorrow. You know, the reason why so many people are out of breath is they're bringing all the problems of tomorrow into today. The they're trying to handle today's problems and tomorrow's problems. And God said he'd give us enough grace for today. Now, I'm, I realize we ought to plan. We ought to make plans. The Lord made plans for our life before we were ever born. But so many people just worry and have anxiety about tomorrow, and they don't worship God today. Some time ago, a man walked into the, the, the office, and he was happy for the first time in months. And his friend said to, me, to him, said, what's happened to you? I, I mean, I've been, you've been so discouraged for so long. He said, well, there's a new company that started a few weeks ago in our town that hires professional warriors. And so I went by there, and I signed a contract with the company. And so now I go by in the morning, and I tell them what I'm afraid of, what I worry about, what I'm anxious about. And now I don't have to worry because they're worrying. I don't have to be afraid because they're afraid for me. And that guy said, well, that's pretty cool. How much does that cost? He said, well, it costs $1,000 a month. He said, well, how are you going to pay for that? He said, that's their worry, man. That's not my worry. Now, don't you wish we had somebody we could take our worries to, our fears to? We do, my friend. He's the king of the universe. He invites us to come every day. You see, we have to learn to worship God in the present day. It's a provided day. But third, it is a priceless day. He said this is the day. He doesn't say this is a day. He said this is the day. I don't know how many days there have been prior to this one. But I know this, there's only one the day. We are living in the day. This is a priceless day. My wife homeschools our girls, and so every so often our whole family travels abroad together. And as sometimes when we travel together, we, we, we will visit particular museums along the way. And I can hear somebody go, really, Dad? You take your children to museums? Well, yeah, it depends on what you value, right? Um, you know, muse means to think. Put an A in front of muse, all muse means no think. Museum is a place where you think. Amusement park is where you go not to think. <laughs> Museums, the ticket prices are low. Amusement parks, the ticket prices are high. At the museum, the lines are short. But at the amusement park, the line is, lines are long. Now, I'm just giving you something to think about this morning. Now, I took my daughters to the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, for a number of reasons. But one reason is I wanted them to see the Mona Lisa. 
Now, the Mona Lisa is a priceless item. It doesn't matter how much money you have, you can't buy it. Why? Because there's one, so the quantity is low, one. And the quality by Leonardo da Vinci. So you have the quality and the quantity made by a unique person. Therefore, it, uh, it is priceless, painted between 1504 and 1506. It is a priceless item. Have you ever given somebody a gift and you didn't feel like they appreciated the gift that you gave? Maybe you gave it to a child or a grandchild or a friend. And, you, and then later you saw the gift on the floor. Or you saw the dog dragging the gift across the floor. <laughs> or maybe it was left outside. And in your heart you said, you don't value the gift that I gave you. Now how many days are like today? One. How many gods are there? One. And the God who's creator of all things created this day. If the Mona Lisa is beyond currency, what is the value of this day? And I wonder if God looks down and says, look how you mismanage it. Look how you drag it around. Look how you don't care about the value of the day. I'm here to tell you, my friend, this is a priceless day. We need to live this day, worship in this day like it is our last day because it is the greatest day of all, the greatest day of all. So how do we start with this day? We start with prayer. We don't just venture out without prayer. We give our day back to God. We learn to prioritize our day. We can't be everywhere. We can't do everything. Good things become bad things when they rob us of the best things that God has planned for us. I don't have time to read the good books because I've not read all the best books yet. I don't have time just to cultivate the good relationships because I haven't cultivated all the best relationships yet. Good, better, best. I will never settle until my good is better and my best, better is best. My friend, every day we give God our best. I said we give our God our best. He gave us his best. We give our best. We give our time, talents, and treasures, and we worship the Lord because he is the king of the universe. We learn to prioritize our day. And we go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says we redeem the time in an evil age. And how do we do it? By being filled every day with the power of the Holy Spirit. See, this is a provided day. It's a present day. It's a priceless day. But it's a providential day. He says this is the day the Lord. Stop there. The Lord. You got to see the Lord in the day. So many of us see everything else but the Lord in the day. We start with our bad news first rather than the good news first. We got to see the Lord in the day. The secret to maximizing every day is to seeing the Lord in the day. There's nearly 2 million Christians in Iran today, for example. More Christians in Iran today than there were 40 years ago when the revolution began. Don't think for one skinny Delaware second that Christianity is about to go out of business in this world. God is blessing his church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. But they got up today in Iran, and they said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Not because of freedom, not because of prosperity, but because the Lord is in their day. He says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us. Do you have an us? In your day are you worshiping by yourself or do you have a worship people in your life make a list of the closest friends you have in your life but that's a picture of where you'll be five years from now you need to decide who your closest allies and friends will be in this life he says this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. He doesn't say let you. He doesn't say let me. He says let us rejoice and be glad. We ought to have circulate with people that rejoice and are filled with gladness. We attract who we are, not what we want. We need to be the men and women who lead by example, that teach how to worship the Lord in the storms, in the sunshine, in the ups and downs of life so that we can declare him the king of kings and the Lord of lords oh my friend this is a providential day the lord is in our day but quickly and last it's a passing day he said this is the day the lord has made it's present but it's passing it's here but it's fading away you know god gives us time time is a gift 
in heaven, time doesn't exist. Time is here. God gave us time to help us measure our life. God gave us time so that we might be able to govern our life. We can't borrow time. We can't take time. We can't give time. We can't loan time. We can't put time in a bottle. We can't put time in a bank and get interest on it. We can either use time or lose time. It's here, but then it is gone. Many years ago, I came across a poem that spoke so deeply to me, and I have pondered it all these years. I want you to see it. When as a child I left and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I daily grew, time flew. Soon I shall find myself traveling on, time gone. Whatever we're going to be, we need to start being. Whatever we're going to do, we need to start doing. Whatever it lo those old habits we need to lay aside, there's no better day than today. When we need to work on our rejoicing and gladness, there's no better time than today. You say, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow doesn't exist. Tomorrow is a figment of our imagination. When tomorrow gets here, it'll be today. We are to live and serve God while it is day. The Hebrew writer said, enter into my rest while it is day. The Lord said there will come a time when no man, no woman will work because the night has come and the day has been given away. Whatever we're going to be, whatever we're going to do, we need to get being, get doing now. And we need to determine to maximize every day for the glory of the Lord. Every day should be a day filled with worship and praise and adoration to the Lord. We should begin our day worshiping and take his presence with us throughout the entirety of the day. God has given us a wonderful future. But God calls us, ladies and gentlemen, to reach out and seize it for the glory of the Lord. Would you please stand with me in this sacred gathering today as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed in this service today. I count it a privilege to preach and teach where Pastor Ryan preaches week after week after week. I'm grateful to be able to be here today. I mean that with, the, with all that's within my spirit. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed in this service. Today is the only day we have. Tomorrow is a figment of our imagination. Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow may be a promissory note, but today is the only cash, the only currency that we have. This is God's day. This is the day of opportunity. We have to reach out, claim it, climb it, and conquer it. This is our day. And God is challenging us in this beautiful service today to say, Lord, this day going forward, I'm going to maximize every day. I'm going to let go of some things that don't need to be in my life, and I'm going to maximize every day. I'm going to worship you like I have never worshiped and served you like I've never served you going forward. We can't do anything about yesterday. Don't get beat up about yesterday. Let it go. Start today. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. And if you can say with integrity, Lord, please help me. Please help me to go forward in this day and every day while it's day and maximize each day and worship you like I've never worshiped and served you before. When I count to three, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. And my hand will be the first one that will be up in this building today. And God wants to help us. He wants to help us to make every day a worship day. One Two, three, that's you. Just lift your hand. Just keep it up. There are no big shots here today. Lord, you see the hands that are lifted in this beautiful sanctuary today. Lord, we pray that you will so captivate our imagination and that you would help us to control our thoughts that become like a rudder that guide our life. Lord, I pray that you will minister profoundly and supernaturally to each and every one of our hearts here today. Do this work in his heart and her heart. Lord, I just pray that you will flood their mind and soul and spirit with the, what can be done as we worship and surrender our life totally and completely to you. Lord, we thank you for this. 
We believe, God, you are the author and the finisher of our, of our faith. You got us in this race. You're going to help us to finish this race. Lord, thank you for trusting us with this race that is before us. We give you the praise and the glory for it in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen, amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. 